In Civ 6, or Civilization 6, traders can quite literally make or break your game. You might know traders as steroids for your cities to get gains, but there are a lot of other uses militarily, culturally, and even religiously. So what are the five trading mistakes that everyone may or may not make in Civilization 6? The first thing we have is tourism. Sending merchants to tell people of another land that you got big titty goth girlfriends back home is a surefire way to boost the tourism sector and thus give you an advantage in any culture game. But what you may not know is the amount of tourism you can get in Civilization 6 by just using traders. For every trader you have, you get a 25% tourism modifier to that specific Civ. There are two great merchants that give another 25% bonus to every trade route, and we are not done yet. You can get another 50% from plugging in the online community's policy card. This all equates to 125 potential tourism for a single trade route per enemy sieve. Now, you can only get the bonus, you know, with one trade route per sieve, so sending two sieves won't give you like 250% extra tourism, it only works on the first trade route. This right here, though, is game-changing, and it's not as if you have to go to Hogwarts and graduate valedictorian to learn how to get the max bonuses, no. Trade routes are easy. Add in the policy card, which is, again, easy, since culture should be oozing out the ass at this point, and you won't be able to, you won't have to go too far on the civic tree in order to get the policy card, and the two great people are merchants. They're less loved by the AI than Cinderella in her prime. You can scoop up these two easily and have huge bonuses, almost as big as your dick after leaving a like and subscribing for not only the new genital DLC drop, but to also not miss out on future content. In any case, these bonuses aren't exact numbers, so how much tourism can you expect from using this strategy? Well, 125% is double and an extra quarter on top of it. And in most games, getting to, let's say, I don't know, 500 tourism by the Atomic Era should be on the low end, but let's stick with it. That equals 625 extra tourism per turn for sending one trade route. Unless I've unknowingly been engaging in crackhead activities again, then this number should be right, and adding in open borders, which you should already have, will increase the number further. Traders are mostly underused from what I've seen in this game, and doubly so for culture victories. But traders are unironically one of the biggest factors in getting that culture win in record time before some guy gets a science win, especially on deity. Finally, you can send one trader per nation. At least only one will get the benefits, otherwise Civilization VI would be almost as broken as Battlefield. Almost. But that still leaves you with, if we use a regular map and settings, five different opportunities to use this buff, multiplying the 625 by 5 to equal 3,125 extra tourism being exported, which yeah, imagine having an automatic extra rock band concert every couple of turns. That's how strong this can be, and we've only used the minimum numbers. With 1,000 tourism, we're looking at 1250 times 5, which equals 5,000 extra tourism total, and that right there soddens the underwear. If I had to ask you what is the most important yield to look for when sending traders, everyone would have a different opinion. Some might say, well, you know, food is important for growth in more districts, while others would claim production to help me produce things earlier on. Some might even speak blasphemy and say, well, faith is obviously the most important yield. Aside from the last one, they're all good answers, but in my opinion, the best yield isn't a yield necessarily, but a bonus. That's right, I tricked you with the trick question sending traders to city-states with a quest for trade routes gives you a free envoy. Now, why is this more important than the other options? Getting an early suzerain is much more beneficial, depending on not only the suzerain ability, but also your early game goals. Need help with an invasion? Getting your own Belarus puppet led by your own little Lukashenko can help ease your invasion, while likewise preventing your enemy from staging operations from that city-state. City-states get more units than you would think early on, especially in the early game, and while they might have a strategy of sending units in waves to get slaughtered by the enemy World War I style, that's kind of good for you because the AI will have to divert resources and troops to take on that army. This is obviously much better earlier on without walls, and when less units from a limited amount of cities early are available to the AI, can turn a losing invasion to a fat W and free land. But wait, there's more. Depending on the suzerain bonus, it can be ideal to secure an early game city-state. Going up against Georgia, whose walls would make China blush, a god will be of service. You want more great people? Bologna's always an easy choice. Hell, Geneva or Kumasai are always good options for the suzerain bonuses, and getting one or even two early city 
these states can give you a big advantage in bonuses while only sacrificing the minor yield traders get in the early game anyways. That's not even talking about getting a nice golden age as getting the first suzerain of a specific city states will give you three era score every time. Now late game this might be different as there are more ways to get envoys, they're less scarce and the yields are actually dummy thick now, especially as Portugal. But early game it's a no brainer. The final minor thing about this is the visibility. If you hate scouts as much as I do, then you won't have a dedicated courier roaming the Mojave wasteland. And getting city states with even Amani early on can give you some extra visibility to plan for future settles in Civilization 6. Before we get to the next section, comment down below what other game mechanics, mistakes, or tip videos you want to see. Think spies, secret societies, that sort of thing, or other trader mistakes you know of, or even something I said wrong in the video. And now what you've all been waiting for, war. Traders have historically been used as forward scouts for civilizations like the Mongols throughout history, as having some people who know the area before sending in a force can help you out dramatically to avoid traps and learn the lay of the land. In Civilization 6, it's definitely there in the game, and ironically, Mongolia makes the most use of this ability. Having an extra level of Diplo visibility gives you an extra 3 combat strength, whereas Mongolia gets double that. It might not seem like much until you realize Oligarchy gives 4 combat strength, and having what is in essence an extra oligarchy almost seems a lot nicer than what you would think. The thing with traders is that they set up trading posts giving an extra level of diplo visibility and in the early game that's massive. The only way to get early diplo visibility before spies is to send a delegation, play Catherine, or set up a trading post. Well the problem with delegations is that the fact after you declare war the delegation is removed and you lose that level of diplo visibility. And the second option requires you to play the French. Yuck. That leaves only the last option. Trading posts early on give you an extra advantage if you can declare war before the AI sets up their own trading post in your territory. Now be careful as taking the city with the trading post removes the bonus. So the best way is to send the trader to the capital because after that falls, you've pretty much won the war. This works doubly well for France and Mongolia because Catherine starts with an extra level of diplo visibility and Mongolia gets two levels for trading posts, giving you up to six extra combat strength when attacking a sieve where you where your little birdie set up shop so at worst you get an almost extra oligarchy. At best, your warriors are now armed with wood as hard and large as the average Civ Lifer subscribers. Six combat strength is essentially two shotting other warriors or even spearmen of the same combat strength and with the extra combat strength your units will survive longer than the enemies and with that you get more promotions, namely battle cry and another seven combat strength when fighting units indirectly from having more diplo visibility. It's a stretch, I know, it's definitely something Alex Jones would talk about, but it's true. And with up to 13 extra combat strength, or even 10 in most cases, you've pretty much leveled up and have the equivalent of one era as an advantage. Finally, traders create roads, roads give movement speed, meaning with a smart trader before a war, you can have your own little blitzkrieg in the ancient or classical era. The next mistake is one I didn't necessarily know before, but it makes sense in context. If you have a coastal city in Civilization 6, you can trade with other coastal cities no problem. You don't need any specific requirements, heck you don't even need sailing. Send your traders off on a raft and hope for the best. But if you want to trade with an inland city on another continent, then you need to have a harbor. Before getting into the gameplay implications, can we take a minute to view how stupid this is? This is like going to Arby's and actually ordering their food. It just doesn't make sense. So I can send my traders on makeshift rafts to other coastal cities on other continents, but when they ask if we can trade with their landlocked capital five tiles away, our traders go, oh no, sorry, see, we can't do that because our starting city doesn't have a harbor, so, uh, yeah but you're already here. What does a harbor have to do with anything? Just walk, dude. It's within your trading distance. No, no, no. Sorry, we can't do it. It's just the law. Aside from that, this isn't the biggest thing to worry about since most of your coastal cities are going to have harbors anyway, but if you're playing someone like Mali or Portugal or even Spain, then you're going to want to build harbors everywhere just so you can get the most amount of yields possible because chances are their inland cities are going to be farther away and might make more profit. Unless the coastal cities are larger or their capital, but we could just ignore that. Now, 
Now, this doesn't really matter too much for Pangea maps or if you only want to trade on your continent as your traders can just walk there. But on any other map, trading with other continents is going to be more profitable, mainly because the distance traveled is farther, which gives you more yields. And since the other continent has sieves that haven't felt your conqueror's wrath yet, they'll probably be better off in yields and districts. So if you didn't want to build the harbor before for whatever reason, now it's most definitely a necessity, especially if Egypt is on that second continent. And finally, the last sort of tip or mistake in Civilization VI when it comes to traders is that yields are mainly based on the destination city, not the origin city. This doesn't factor trade routes the AI sends to you, but you can't exactly control that since finding out what and why the AI is doing requires a neuroscience PhD. But for your yields, the routes always depend on the destination city. You can see this in the domestic trade route screen in the early game, where your capital is going to get less yields when sending traders to your other cities, but your other cities get more yields when trading with your capital. Probably because with the palace and extra time being up, your capital is going to be a lot bigger and stronger than your other cities. Now, how can you abuse this like a drunken stepfather? Set up cities on the outskirts and send your traders to the enemy capital or the enemy's strongest and largest city. It doesn't really matter, whichever one's better. The reason for this is the fact that pound for pound, trading with enemy capitals is 99 out of 100 times the best play. But early game, the trader range is about as long as half a marathon, so you will probably need to forward settle a little to get the most gold, culture, and science out of the enemy cities. And if your capital is close enough to be within range of the other AI's capital, then you have other things to worry about and the AI won't have a capital in about 50 turns. Over the course of the game, as trade routes get longer, eventually your other cities can all end up reaching enemy's best cities or capitals or whatever, then you can assign more traders to different cities to get the best bang for your buck, especially when it comes to science and culture. Unless you're lazy like me and you just click on the biggest number that shows up on the screen first. But with an alliance, and especially if you're near Egypt who gives all traders going to their cities more food for you, you are going to want to set up those godly trade routes earlier on for more gold, production, and potentially food. And finally, science and culture is the biggest beneficiary of this factor, as you'll be able to catch up to the enemy AI on the tech tree a lot quicker if you are behind.